uh, we're delighted that we have Susanna Baker here. And Susanna is a co-founder of the Pickwell Foundation. I, I think, Susanna, you should tell us a little bit about the Pickwell Foundation. It's a great story of how you guys got started. And you're doing amazing work in North Devon. I've been in meetings with the civil servants and government officials that are running the Homes for Ukraine program. And you're always there offering really practical, helpful advice. So thanks for what you're doing there. Tell us a little bit about the story and then give us your insights uh, into how we can make our placements work. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Now, you've only given me seven minutes, so I can't tell you our whole story. <laughs> But I'll tell you a little bit. So we, um, so as Chris said, thank you, Chris. We are um, the Pickwell Foundation, and we're based across Northern Devon, and um, we we provide wraparound support for refugees coming from all around the world um, who are fleeing uh, war and violence um, through a scheme called the Community Sponsorship Scheme. But more latterly, we've been providing support for those guests fleeing from Ukraine. For our homes for Ukraine. Um, program we have a team of caseworkers who are visiting both um, guests and sponsors and we try to assess and signpost in order to meet the needs of both as both parties are essential um, to the working of this scheme and this whole thing um, going okay. So after we've heard about issues around transport because we're quite a rural um, location and questions about whether it's possible to collect your uh, BRP cards and stay for a bit, but actually longing to go and visit home, is that okay and can we come back again? After those two questions, we have um, heard a few of um, sort of, especially from sponsors, but also from guests about misunderstandings around cultural personality or parenting kind of differences, um, and also trauma that shows itself through various behavior patterns, nighttime disturbances, various things. And many, in fact, most of our sponsors are doing amazingly with this. And despite it being really quite hard at times, they're fully supportive and understanding of how unique and difficult the situation is and how broken their guests must be feeling. However, sometimes uh, it is too much and occasionally there are particular circumstances that have led to a sponsor asking their guests to leave. This is clearly not a good situation for anyone. And here in North Devon, we try to help as much as we can but the offers of local accommodation, as I imagine elsewhere in the country, are starting to dry up. Unfortunately, the only option for our guests at this point is to present to the local authority as homeless. In North Devon, if you need temporary accommodation and you could be placed as far away as Cornwall or Exeter, which might sound really close to you guys if you're not in Devon, but if you live in rural North Devon, Exeter's kind of a good over an hour's drive away. It's really difficult if your children are in school or if you started a job. Um, in fact, it's impossible to carry it, carry it on, uh, but it's wherever the accommodation can be found. And as we all know, there's a housing crisis and that's really tricky to find. The process for presenting as homeless and applying for temporary accommodation cannot be started until the person or the family have actually been evicted. So this is a really awful situation for anyone to encounter um, in any circumstance, but especially after you've been through so much already. So what are the other options? The best option for everyone concerned is that they stay where they are. The guests stay where they are with you as a host for as long as possible. I know you've only committed to six months, but six months, you know, that's great. Let's, that's still a good amount of time. Longer would even be even better. Um, but as a host or sponsor, there were never any guarantees that it was going to be easy for anyone. However, there are things that can be done to make the experience easier on everyone involved. So my family and I lived with another family and we ran a business together and raised our children together for 10 years. There were times when I felt so angry um, with, with the situation that I was described as having a go away face. I've edited that for the purposes of this webinar. You'll be pleased to hear, Chris. Um, every time my friend walked in the room, I would present that face to her, which she uh, gleefully pointed out to me when we got over that hump. Um, however, from the beginning, we made a commitment to each other and we said that we would always, we would stay the course, we would set a date for review and that we would always work things through relationally if things got really difficult. And there was something about making this commitment inside ourselves that kept us going even through the darkest of times. Um, and there are, so we've been thinking about this and there are four things that, that we found that might help the relationships between the guest and the host to be as strong and as understanding as possible. So just quick practical things. So number one is talking about your hopes and expectations. 
it's most helpful to clearly define your boundaries around your home routines and how you like things done the kitchen the bathroom you know how you like the, the cushions on the sofa to be um, but do this from as early as possible after the guests have arrived rested and found their feet these conversations can only take place when both parties are likely to be at their most receptive our culture can often be that we shy away from these honest conversations, especially those that might be slightly awkward with someone who's escaping war who you've only just met. So it's understandable that that feels really tricky to do. However, there are a couple of things here. Firstly, there can be a feeling of real safety when boundaries are set. Everyone knows the rules. There's something to work to. It's like a guidebook, if you, if you like. Second guessing what, what you, you as a host are thinking as a guest. Um, can be far worse than having a, just a straightforward uh, conversation with understanding. Secondly, my new Ukrainian colleagues have taught me that our culture beats around the bush far too much. Um, and to such an extent that they find it confusing and sometimes frustrating too. They would far rather we say it like it is. Um, this is much more the Eastern European culture and feels more familiar and normal. So secondly, the second point is build a support group around you. And I know I mentioned this in a previous, previous webinar of Chris's, but it's worth saying again, it is extremely hard to do what you're doing alone. Please do reach out to friends and neighbours and ask them to take a role within a support framework for you and your guest. There are so many people out there who want to help. Let them and be specific about what you're asking them to do from giving lists to accompanying to the job centre, filling out forms, making a meal for you sometimes as a, as a family or a household. We would recommend you draw up a rotor so it's really clear and that everyone knows exactly what they're doing. And number three, we're nearly there, really work to gain an understanding of the cultural norms and values in Ukraine. There are many resources around this to help now. There are so many, um, including the Sanctuary Foundation course, which is hopefully a link will be put up for you. And also in North Devon, we did a sort of mini overview version of that, and that's on our website, which hopefully will be put up for you as well. By knowing more about the context from which your guests have come, there will be a greater understanding of why some things might be done differently to what you're expecting. And fourthly, take trauma into account in everything. I just heard someone say to me last week, they said, um, oh, our guests are coming, but um, it's OK because the children left before um, any they saw anything of the war. So there won't be trauma. At least we won't have that to deal with. Actually, I, I'm not going to talk about trauma. There are experts on this call that are going to do that. But always take trauma into account with everything, every behaviour or interaction that you have, because there is no doubt at all that that child and those children and, and the parent that's coming with them have suffered trauma. Anyone leaving their home, their family, their possessions, their school, their friends is going to be feeling trauma. Um, so overall, I just want to say that it is incredible what you are all doing for the people of Ukraine, for our country and across Europe. Um, it's a self-sacrifice on a huge scale, but one that we remembered not only in history, but also in the lives of all those that you've touched and supported. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you, Susanna. So encouraging. Wonderful, wonderful um, advice here. Thank you so much. Um, we've had quite a few questions about moving on. Um, and I'm just wondering from your local experience, this housing fear is out there and you've kind of told us it's real help us get prepared for reality. I mean, people have moved in, they've got to know an area, maybe their children have started going to a local school mm. after the disruption of leaving Ukraine and then setting up life here again. Um, it, it would be very sad if those kids then had to move school to go to some more housing. What, what are some things that people could be doing now? Um, is there any practical advice that you can give us as we try to find local housing? I think probably just a couple of things. I think firstly, if there was a way to make life more sustainable for you, for them to stay with you for longer um, before they are able to go back home, that's one thing. If it's not, if life really isn't sustainable and you've tried, you've done all the top tips, you've listened to webinars like this, you're fully full of the knowledge of what you ought to do, but it's still not working, then I think, well, for us here, and I know that this is happening nationally as well, um, there are all sorts of people who volunteered in the first instance to, to host guests. 
And for some reason or another, circumstances changed or, you know, um, maybe they thought, oh, actually, we'll just wait a little bit longer and we'll just see what happens. What would be incredible is if we had a second tranche of people that could come forward, that mm. we could build a register and that we could uh, move people. It's like you've had your turn. Well done, host. You've done six months. That's brilliant. Or eight months or a year or whatever it is. Um, now we have this amazing register of people who are in the area. So that consistency of school places and work can mm. stay the same, but maybe they just move accommodation for, for, for the second chapter, but it stays local. But that, that has to rely on people coming yeah. forward again and saying, yeah, we're willing to do it now. We know that we didn't initially, but mm. we're ready now. That's great. I, I like that. I, I think ideally we would all love it. I think the Ukrainians I'm speaking to, as well as the hosts, is if we can help people find their own house, that they can lock a front door, shields oh. down, don't have to speak someone else's language, don't have to navigate when I can use the bathroom and the kitchen. Um, and, and for my trauma expert friends, that idea of agency, I get to choose, is quite important in the rebuilding of life. Uh, there may be people on this call um, who, who have a network or, or are connected with housing. Um, I'm, I'm working on some pilot projects with the Church of England. They're about to start up a new housing association. Uh, we're talking with the National Residential Landlords Associations. There is no quick easy solutions that's why currently around eleven and a half thousand afghan people are still in hotels having arrived here in the um uh, in the summer in august uh, so it is going to be relatively easy to find housing for the ukrainians because they're smaller groups but still there is a national housing shortage so uh, if, if that's something that you're interested in exploring drop us a line i think you've all got my email um, because I put it on the Eventbrite, so you can contact me directly. Um, just another couple of quick questions while you're here, Susanna. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of love for the uh, kind of support hubs. A lot of churches seem to be running those. That's great to hear. Um, but some questions about national insurance cards. Um, does, a, does a Ukrainian need a national insurance card before they can start work? Do you, do you know anything about that? Oh, gosh, I should know this. Where's my colleague, Christy, when you need her? Um, okay. You could Google think, her in or think, I think the answer is that you don't need a national insurance card. I think that's the answer. But I okay. don't have a word for it. Better cool. find out. All right. We'll do a bit of research uh, in the meantime. But thank you, Susanna. Such, such helpful content and really wonderful work you're doing in North Devon. Thank and uh, it, it is a most beautiful part of the country. And we're grateful <laughs> that you joined us this evening.